Good morning, and welcome to worship on this beautiful rainy day. Uh, we're thankful that we're here, but we know we need the rain, so this is good stuff. Uh, before we begin, uh, real quick on announcements, I invite you to turn to page 13 of your service folder for all of uh, the updates that we have to offer. You'll notice there's a lot going on October 6th. Uh, there are two completely different services that morning. We have an 8 a.m. service and a 10 o'clock service. Make sure you're bringing your pets to the correct service. And also that means that you're expected to attend both services that day. So this, I don't make the rules. I just tell you what is expected of you. So uh, join us. But then after service, I have a friend here, Shirley, who's wearing a shirt that should make no questions about what she's here for. Ask me about the crop walk. So if you have questions about the crop walk, Shirley is our friend. Uh, it is uh, on the 6th uh, that afternoon. So again, lots going on coming up. It, it's a busy season in the life of the church and in the world around us. So if you have questions about Crop Walk at any level, check in with Shirley. The shirt will make it impossible for you to miss it. So this is a great opportunity to invite questions and conversation. Today, during our service, we will be presenting Bibles to our third, fourth, and fifth graders. Traditionally in this congregation in years past, they went to third graders. But when you don't hand them out for a few years, you hand them out to third, fourth, and fifth graders, which is what's happening here. So I, uh, uh, I am making up for lost time, as it were. We are making up for lost time. But we wanted to make sure that we hand these over into the hands of the children of our congregation because it is very important that we do this for so many reasons. Uh, but the most prominent of all is uh, a reminder that we commit to do this in baptism. We say that we're going to put scriptures in their hand, and that is what we are doing here today. So we look forward to that here in just a few moments. Before we get there, though, let us begin our worship with our call to worship printed on page two of your service folder. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we gather together in our worship, let us rejoice in sharing the gift of God's peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I'd invite the assembly to take a moment to share a sign of that peace as we rise together for our gathering song this day. Peace be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together we pray. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. 
Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The assembly may be seated. I'd like to invite our children forward uh, for a special message here today. If you could join me up front, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, seat, seat. Come on up, friends. Right here, 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 right here. No. Or there, that's fine, whatever. Um, all right. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, today is a special day. I mentioned a few moments ago, if you are in third, fourth, or fifth grade, stand up for me. Third, fourth, or fifth. Okay. Okay. I got the two of you here. Okay. So this is really important stuff. I've got some friends up here to help me out. We're going to be giving you your Bible. A, you. That's fine. I'll share my Bibles with you. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. My, my uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders, I need you to stand. My other friends, you're going to help with this blessing. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to bless these Bibles as we, as we share them with you. And as I said in the first service, Nothing is ever free, so it's going to take about 10 minutes to do this, okay? So this is going to be a test of all of our patients um, as we do this here together. But I want to make sure that as we share these with you, that you all fully understand just what a gift this is and how thankful we are to be able to share it with you. So with that, let us start. Are you ready? Here we go. A long time ago, it was really hard to make books. And so there were only a few copies of books because you couldn't just type the words on a computer and print them off in your home. Scribes had to use ink and parchment and write each and every word, and it took a really, 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 really long time. The church, therefore, didn't have a lot of Bibles. There were enough for priests and bishops and super fancy church people who could read Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. That's not me. But most Christians couldn't read the language. Now, if you're the only one who can read the Bible and everyone else has to listen to what you have to say, that's a lot of power. You could tell people anything you want. You could leave out the parts that you didn't understand. You could say all kinds of stuff about God and Jesus, and they wouldn't even know if it was true or not. Fast forward to about 500 years ago, a fancy church guy named Martin Luther, you might have heard of him, started to write the Bible down in German, a language that the people could actually understand. And then he made a bunch of copies with this brand new machine and it made books easier to get. He started to hand them out, and pretty soon lots of people had Bibles that they could read themselves. And people brought their questions to the fancy church leaders, including... Did Jonah really get swallowed up by a big fish, or was that pretend? Why did God let all those terrible things happen to Job? And you never told us about this grace I thought I had to earn God's love. So, do you have a friend or a sibling, and sometimes you may play with toys together and the mess is even bigger, right? You know how that works. Well, the same thing happens in the church. The fancy church people like to keep the Bible and all the questions about the Bible neat and organized for just a few people to use. But thanks to Martin Luther and the other reformers, there were Bibles and questions everywhere. They got curious and creative, and it made a big mess because all of a sudden, everyone was allowed to play. Do you think God likes it when everyone gets to participate? Do you think God is glad that the Bible is in lots of languages so people all over the world can read it? Do you think God's okay with this kind of mess? I think God loves that mess. So here's the thing. We need your help. As we give you these Bibles, we need your help. To make church messy, to make sure kids know they can participate, and to remember how important it is to learn about God together from each other at home and not just at church. So today I want you to turn around, okay? Look out here. This is your church family. And at your baptism, do you remember your baptism? A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. Oh, you remember every detail? Yeah, I'm sure you guys do. So, we made a promise, the church made a promise to you that we would put a Bible in your hands and that we would make sure that you could read the scripture yourself so that you could get uh, curious about God and scripture too. But, there's a warning. Have you ever seen a warning label on something? Yes, oh yeah, right, right. So careful, my warning to you is that it's going to get messy. 
There's going to be stories in here that are confusing or gross or silly or cool. The Bible has familiar stories and some you may have never heard of. You can read it to yourself or out loud or to a family member or friend. Or you can have someone read it to you. Because thank goodness there are enough Bibles for everyone here in this world. So, these are study Bibles. We want you to open it up when you get in a confirmation class. Open it up when you get home. Open it up in a few moments and read today's gospel out of it as I read it to you. You can write in these Bibles. You can make mar you know, uh, anything you need in the margins. Whatever you need to do to help you learn scripture, that's important. Because Psalm 199 reminds us, uh, God, your word is a lamp on my feet and a light for my path. So now, we want to put these in your hands with the hope that you will be curious and open to the word of God. So now we got to bless you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to officially hand these over. These are yours now. The rest of my friends, I need you to stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. All right, now, I know you're going to be good at this, right? Blessing hands. Here we go. Blessings. Not you guys. You're receiving the blessing. Yeah. You guys. <laughs> Caden, help me out. Put your hands like this. There it is. All right. Remember, blessings are directional in this church, so you got to kind of shoot them that way. Okay, here we go. Ready? I invite us all to pray this blessing over our students. Living God, we give you thanks for the many ways your word invites us into relationship with you and each other. Bless these children with curious hearts and open minds that the Bible would spark questions that lead to more questions, faith that grows and gets messy, and a deeper love for you. Through Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. Amen. Can, do you feel blessed? Yeah, you do. Well, let's turn around and let's applaud our friends as they begin this journey together. A wave for the people. And now I would invite all of you to go back to your seats at this time. But the two of you, I would invite you to open your Bibles and follow along because you can do that now. Okay, see if you can find our readings today. Our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 11. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew, then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retributions among them and upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading is from James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom, but if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have, but you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your own pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. At this time, I invite the assembly to rise for our gospel acclamation. According to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. 
for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The assembly may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Who is the goat? Who is the goat? That's a good question these days. The greatest of all time. Who is the greatest basketball player of all time? It's obviously Michael Jordan. And if you say anything else, you're wrong. And it's okay to be wrong. Just admit it, please, right? Who's the greatest Chicago Bears quarterback of all time? Uh, it's a debate I'd rather not have today, to be honest with you. I've had a good Sunday so far, and I'm kind of nervous about what's going to happen this afternoon. So we don't need to talk about it. Who's the greatest president of all time? CBS News did a poll to decide who it was. I'd be curious, who do you think the greatest president is? Guess yeah. Yeah, I, I get a lot of Lincolns. Believe it or not, nosed doubt by FDR right at the finish line. Apparently, according to their standards, FDR is the greatest president. Lincoln is a very close second, right? This is interesting, though, because we see the subjectivity of these debates of the greatest of all time. What's the greatest Chicago-style hot dog, right? Well, if you go on GeneAndJudes.com, guess who they say? Yeah, Gene and Judes, as it turns out, right? There's a little bit of subjectivity to this. If you were to ask me, Pastor, what is your favorite national park? I would probably tell you whichever one I was at most recently. Recency bias plays a role in all of this, right? Whenever we have these discussions about who's the greatest of all time, really, they're fun exercises, they're good distractions, but they're always flawed conversations, right? They always kind of lead us in different directions and certainly are plagued with issues like subjectivity, recency bias, and so much more. Well, recently, Jesus, just last week in our gospel, informed his disciples that they were going to experience something. They were going to experience his death and his resurrection three days later. And at the end of it, he asks all of his would-be followers, and you must take up your cross and follow me. Jesus makes this invitation, but Jesus today, I believe, is not fully sure that they understand this invitation. And I say this for a few reasons. One, Jesus is repeating himself. This is the second time he's made this prediction. It's like with my kids. If I don't think they understand what I've asked them to do, I repeat myself. And then again, and then again, and then again, and again. That's what happens. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He doesn't believe they fully understand. But moreover, our gospel writer reminds us but they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. So it's, it's in the Bible, actually. They straight up don't understand what Jesus is saying to them. And I think what's curious about this is it's not that they're incapable of understanding. It's that they lack the divine curiosity necessary to fully understand what it is that Jesus, the divine, is offering them. They lack the ability to acknowledge that maybe they don't know everything. They lack the ability to see that maybe sometimes they don't understand what Jesus is saying. But they've also lacked the ability to ask those necessary qualifying questions to learn more. Divine curiosity, I think, is a really beautiful gift from God. And when I think about divine curiosity, particularly in scripture, my mind immediately goes to Mother Mary. I go to Mary and the Magnificat. I go to that moment where she is told, you will carry the Son of the Most High. And rather than, than run away, what does she do? She asks a question. 
She looks for clarity. She wants to understand. She says, how can that be? And the angels say, well, the Holy Spirit's going to get involved. And her response then, after she gets that clarification, is, here I am. The response of every faithful servant throughout Scripture when they've accepted what is in front of them, when they understand what God is calling them to be and to do, here I am. And even after she says it, we're told she continues to ponder in her heart these things as she continues to seek understanding. And my guess is that at some point in your life, you've had this moment too, this moment of divine curiosity. You've asked yourself, how can that be? I have these moments all the time. How can it be that through just a little tiny bit of bread and a little tiny sip of wine or grape juice, I, a rot gut sinner like I am, am fully forgiven by Christ? How can it be that a congregation would call me to be their pastor? It makes no sense to me. It's not a judgment on you guys. It's your problem, not mine. But I'm just saying, how can it be? I was, you know, as a kid, if you handed me a Bible in fifth grade, I probably would have handed it back to you and said, yeah, I'm good. Thanks, but no thanks. Let's give it to someone who might like it, right? How can that be? It's at the center of our Sunday school here at St. Paul. Godly Place Sunday School, predicated on the question, I wonder. I wonder. I wonder what part of the story you like best. I wonder what part of the story was most important. I wonder what part of the story we could leave out and still have everything we need. I wonder how the disciples felt when Jesus told them he was going to die. This is one of those rare occasions where I need not wonder that much. We have an answer. We're told they're afraid. And I think it's the same fear that's holding them back from having that necessary conversation, from asking those necessary questions, from the divine curiosity required to fully grasp what it means to follow. And instead of asking those questions of Jesus, they get caught up in a debate about who is the greatest. And this debate completely misses the point of everything Jesus has been saying to this point. It kind of reminds me of like if they were in a car. I don't know if you ever had a parent of this, but my dad would be like, don't make me come back there, right? That moment. And then one time he actually like pulled the car off the road and it got dead silent in the back. That's what this feels like. It's like Jesus is pulling the car over and looking back. He's like, don't make me come back because they just don't get it. Their their inability to open their minds to understanding is so frustrating that Jesus looks at them and says, if you're still confused, let me make it real clear. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Your call to follow me is actually a call to be servant of all. Greatness through power and domination over others is antithetical to the way of the cross that you have been called to serve. Being the greatest or the first or the best means being the last and the least and the servant of all. And this invitation to be the last and the least is not some sort of onerous demand. It's a liberating opportunity and promise that in being able to see other people and being able to lift up other people and being able to serve other people, you yourself will experience how it is that God is doing the same for you. That you will experience the same love of Christ that you have extended unto your neighbor. And what I think is really tricky for these disciples is that this is really countercultural. This is not what the Messiah was supposed to be. This is not what power is for them. It's so countercultural that in this moment, Jesus does something rather countercultural. He reaches over and he invites a child to come and sit with him. But before we get these very sort of sentimental feelings about this scene. I want to ruin it for you because that's what I get to do as pastor. I get to ruin it. He's like plopping a kid on his lap and being like, look, when I talk about the least of y'all, this is what it looks like. Kids in ancient times did not have any social standing. At best, they were a financial liability. So when he's plucking this child out of the crowd and putting him on his lap, he's not a politician taking a nice picture for a future flyer or ad. No. Instead, This child is to represent what the least of these looks like. 
someone not worth your time, someone that may not even be fully considered a person at this stage in their life. But when he does this, you can't help but think about mom again. You can't help but think about Mary when she sings out, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted the lowly. Here today, about 2,000 years later, we have the same challenges in discipleship as the disciples had way back when. We, like the disciples, sometimes lack that divine curiosity or allow ourselves to be distracted from it. We, as a church, as an institution, are very good at not asking the difficult questions that might lead to greater understanding. Instead, what do we do? We argue over the greatness of the past. Oh, the church was so good back in the day. How great was it? How lovely was it? And what we miss when we're stuck in the past is the fact that actually the cross and the resurrection are ahead of us. Greatness, you see, is not measured in power or prestige, but it is measured in service to our neighbor. Our ability to lift our neighbor up rather than knock them down, to welcome people in rather than cast them aside, is what makes us truly great. Our curiosity towards our neighbor should not be such that we look at our neighbor to rank them, to put them in order based on how useful they might be to me or how, what I will get out of them if I do something for them. But instead, we should be asking, how is it that I can serve my neighbor? When we start to get stuck in this conversation about the greatest of all time, whatever that conversation is, what we're really doing is getting stuck in the past. And we can't do that anymore. The Spirit is moving us forward. That's why Jesus says, follow me. Because the next step is a step forward. It's to go where Jesus goes. It's to carry the cross that Jesus himself will carry. And such work, such work requires faith and courage and curiosity about the unknown. It involves us being curious and asking the questions of God. Just like we said when we blessed these Bibles this morning. Be curious. Be messy. Get stuck in the scripture. Ask the hard questions. Go back and forth. Wrestle with God as God wrestles with us. And as we do that work, today I'd like to end uh, with a prayer. Uh, a prayer that I think is really appropriate for this work. And actually, it's one of my favorite prayers. It comes from, of all places, most commonly it's used in our funeral liturgy. It's one of the petitions uh, for, for that service. And to me, it encapsulates that idea of looking forward courageously and not knowing what's ahead, but understanding that that's where we're called. And instead of getting stuck in the past, maybe we can take that first step forward. So I'd like to actually end this sermon by inviting you to join me in prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
drawn together by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need, responding with the words, your mercy is great. Creating God, you shape the world so there is more than enough for all. Curb our habits of overuse and guide us toward more sustainable sources of energy, food, and water. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, your peace brings justice and solidarity. Encourage peace among peoples, tribes, and nations. Heal divisions in our country and local communities that together we might cooperate for the good of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. Transforming God, you accompany all through changes and transitions. Help us to see where you are calling this community to new ways of living the gospel promise. Assure us that even as change brings loss, it also brings hope and life. Be with the people of Bethany Lutheran Church in Crystal Lake in this season of change as they have extended a call to Katie Mueller to serve as their associate pastor. May their shared ministry be a continued blessing for your church. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Faithful God, you draw near to all who are in need. Bring healing and wholeness to all who suffer, including those on our prayer list. And all those who we name aloud or who we name aloud or in our hearts. Transform economic, political, and social systems that oppress vulnerable, vulnerable people, especially systems of structural racism and generational poverty. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, you embrace us on our final pilgrimage from this life. Accompany all who have died. Console those who mourn and at the last show us the way to eternal life in you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We now take this moment to pause to give thanks for all the gifts that we offer this day, our time and prayer, praise and thanksgiving, those gifts which we leave behind and those which we take with us into the community and world to serve our neighbor in Christ's love. And as always, we just give thanks for the ongoing uh, generosity that you offer and the mission and ministry that we share here in taking up our cross and following Christ wherever that may lead. So with that, I would invite the assembly to please rise as we continue with our invitation to the table this day. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which he has betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We gather at this table of God's mercy and forgiveness. All are welcome. Young and old believers, questioners and questioning believers, we gather to be fed because we are all beloved children of God. All are welcome. There is a place for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, color, culture, socioeconomic circumstance. For Christ is our host, and we are all honored guests. All are welcome. This time I'd invite the assembly to please be seated, and I'd welcome those at home to take and to eat, this is the body of Christ broken for you, and to take and to drink for this the blood of Christ shed for you. For those gathered in the sanctuary here this day, in a moment you'll be invited forward to form two lines in the center aisle beginning in the front rows. You'll come forward to receive the host, either from myself or from Vic Nicholas. You'll then continue to receive either the grape juice, which is the lighter color, or the wine, which is the darker color, as is your preference. You'll then be invited to consume those elements as you return to your seats along the side aisles. There are baskets on either side for the disposal and future recycling of those little plastic cups. We have a gluten-free option available upon request. We also have oversized goldfish. For those who do not commune but already have a place at the table, this is a symbol of Christ in the early church and a reminder that all have a place at Christ's table.
assembly to please rise. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless you now and forever. Amen. pray. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And receive now this blessing. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Amen.